Welcome everyone to AZIPL's Sustaining Soil and Soil Stories of Food and Faith. My name is Chrissy Dart and I'll be the co-host this evening with Nona and we are both board members of Arizona Interfaith Power and Light. Welcome. And those of you who have your videos on, when the storytellers are introduced, it would be lovely if you can clap even though you're muted. You're muted so we don't get feedback or shake your hands. And I do love the emojis. And if you can get emojis, hearts are always appreciated. If it makes you laugh, you laugh. If you wanna clap, clap. Thumbs up can be iffy depending what culture you're in. So there you go. Um, please use the emojis just to shower the hearts on everybody. So I'd like to welcome you in just with a short little uh, meditation as is part of Interfaith Power and Light. As I was thinking about our evening, I have been listening to a series of lectures on Christian mystics. And mystics are often accused of being lazy and only wanting to be alone. But when you start to study the lives of mystics, they love to do their devotions and they have all these great things that happen to them in stillness, a lot of times in nature, but they're always then doing stuff. They have this balance of being still and balance of doing things. They are writing popes, they are feeding the poor, they're building hospitals, all kinds of things. Well, that got me to thinking about tonight about soil. And one of my heroes is George Washington Carver. He came from a, a very difficult, difficult background. In fact, as a child, he was never even expected to live. His mother died when he was very young. He was a, a slave. He had lots of trauma in his life, lots of setbacks, but he loved nature. And, and he sat with it. And he said that when he was with nature, it was like a window into the heart of God. And he also loved people. And I just wanted to share some beautiful quotes from George Washington Carver. He went on to lead a life where he was a distinguished botanist, chemist, mycologist. That man could cook, he could clean, he knitted all his own socks, he could crochet, and he was good at massage. In fact, he developed massage for people with polio using peanut oil and practiced on them, everything for free. Well, the quotes I wanted to share with you about uh, George Washington Carver. The first would be, he wanted young people to always keep their eyes open to what mother nature has to teach, because by doing so, you will learn very many valuable things for your everyday life. And the second thing, especially for this evening, he was very concerned about the condition of the soil in the South and the people that they had enough to eat. And so he had this quote, he spent his life teaching people how to farm with legumes to make the soil better, mainly peanuts, if you don't, if you remember right. And one uh, for this evening, the quote I love for us to think about as we go on. The farmer whose soil produces less every year is unkind to it in some way. That is, he's not doing to it what he should. He's robbing it of some substance it must have. And he becomes therefore for a soil robber rather than a progressive farmer. So for us, I would like to say, may we as George Washington Carver seek to learn about the divine through nature and learn about nature through the divine. Be kind to the soil and work towards the goal that all peoples, as he would say, dinner's, dinner pail may be full of nutritious foods. So I'd like to uh, turn it over now to Nona. We'll be introducing our first storyteller. Hello, thank you and, and welcome everyone. Uh, we are so excited about this program. I am, uh, my name is Nona Siegel. I am um, a board member of Arizona Interfaith Power and Light. I'm just gonna say a couple words about um, AZIPL and the context of this, um, this experience today. Um, AZI, Arizona Interfaith Power and Light is one of uh, 40 state affiliates of the national organization Interfaith Power and Light, which is uh, a spiritual response to the climate emergency. 
Uh, we're connected, uh, or excuse me, we're committed to deepening the connection between ecology and faith um, to mobilize people of faith to turn their ethics into action to reduce the effects of greenhouse gases on our planet and to preserve the complex web of life that uh, we need to have for further generations and for the continuation of all living things um, in our world. Um, this is uh, the beginning of Faith Climate Action Week or Earth Week, um, the week in which, which nestles today <laughs> in the center, which, uh, um, and this year, uh, National Interfaith Power and Light is spotlighting the role of regenerative farming in um, the saving of our planet. Um, there's definitely, there's a discussion that's going to happen, just a little plug for a, a program um, a couple days from now. The film Kiss the Ground um, has uh, been highlighted uh, by Interfaith Power and Light this year to uh, really um, explore the relationship of soil and um, regenerative farming in, um, in healing. And um, there's gonna be a discussion with the producers of that program on uh, Wednesday, uh, April 21st at 11 a.m. Arizona time, if, um, just to let you all know. Um, and that film is available in many ways. If you go to the IPL website there, um, they have uh, links to watch the film for free so that you'd be prepared to ask questions of the producers. So I just wanted to get that onto your radar if you don't have 10 million other things happening this week. Um, as most of us environmental activists do. It's a busy week for, for earth advocates. Um, the film explores the uh, devastation caused by our current food system and the profound power of restoring the so, um, soil and that um, soil that makes life possible. If you really think about it, life is not possible on the planet without the soil. And so we have um, invited a wide range of speakers today to share their personal stories and experiences with soil, with growing food, with connecting to the life force of family, community, the planet and all that is divine. So um, we'll hope that you'll join uh, this journey with us and um, get to know these amazing people that we have the pleasure to, to be with today. Um, so um, the first speaker today is um, on video. Um, Netta Movahead is a, um, uh, we met Netta first as a graduate student. She was a board member of Arizona Interfaith Power and Light for several years when she was in graduate school at the um, uh, School of Sustainability at ASU. And um, she um, graduated, she got finished her PhD. She moved to Iran. Um, to uh, get married and uh, she um, is uh, returning to the United States. So we're very excited about that, but she'll be in Maryland, which is where her family lives. Um, she is um, working to include diverse ways of knowing within uh, formal and learning environments. And in her free time, she enjoys um, carpet weaving, gardening and spending time with her loved ones. So. Um, we have the video, which I believe is going to happen as Doug shares his screen. It's great to see you all here. Ah. Hopefully that is sound. Yeah, I don't think we can hear. with you for this event, Sustaining Our Soil, Stories of Food and Faith. When I was asked to share this story, I immediately thought of my 
great grandfather. And this is a story that comes from my paternal side. So it's my father's grandfather from his mother's side. So my father's maternal grandfather, my great grandfather. And his name was Baba Yadola. Baba means father and Yadola means hand of God. And my great grandfather came from a village called Kaleno, which is in the larger town of Kelardasht. And this is in the northern part of Iran, about one hour away from the Caspian Sea. And I've been fortunate to be living in this town for the last year and on and off for the last few years, um, because my husband actually, his family comes from this same town. And my great grandfather was someone, although I was never blessed to meet him, he was somebody that to me embodies this simultaneously respect for both nature and faith and carried a very deep understanding that was entirely embodied. Obayadola was someone who in the entire village, anytime anybody needed kind of an impartial, uh, let's say judge to heal inner family tensions, he was called upon. Or if somebody needed a loan or something, he was the person that people came to. And he was somebody who self-made his wealth just from farming and tending to the land. And he recognized that when he gave to the land, the land gave back. And he lived to be 107 years old and was said to be able to thread a needle even in his final days of life. You know, it's kind of crazy to think about now in the modern day, but you know, people who really lived with nature could live to be you know, so, so old and, and have that um, awareness from you know, throughout the years. And just to share a little bit about this side of my ancestry before I get into, into my story. Um, so my uh, father's side are Kurds who immigrated. So they, they actually migrated about a thousand years ago. So they were actually from a Western part of Iran and then they uh, trans kind of transplanted up into the North. And the way that they sustained their lives was through um, caring for livestock, working with the land, planting wheat and barley and um, you know having pretty hefty gardens in, in their homes and having chickens. And, and Baba Yadolo actually, I was told he had 48 cows and many, many chickens and ducks and geese and uh, goats and sheep. And he really understood the needs of the different animals and realized that when he would care for the animals and they would give back, there was this re reciprocal relationship. And Baba Yadola was um, of the Ahlehar faith. And this is a faith tradition that is a minority in Iran. And it is recognized for, uh, so the, the name Ahlehar of their, of their faith tradition uh, actually means people of the truth or people who tend towards the truth or guided by the truth. And uh, one of the kind of central tenets of this faith tradition is that each one of us holds a drop of God and to be able to sense God when we sit in circles and we gather around, we are able to connect to this essence and this spirit that is larger than us, but is within each of us. And their religious ceremonies still happen to this day, um, involve music, involve, um, you know, group prayer gathered in circles and involve, um, you know, the kind of ceremonial uh, sacrifice of animals and the ceremonial pre preparation and ritualized cooking um, and then feasting with one another. So that's a bit of a background about the spiritual sustenance that was infused in Baba Yadola from the time he was a child, which he then passed on to my paternal grandmother, who then passed on to my father, who is now passing on to me. And I'm a very unique case because I was somebody born and raised in the US and eventually found my way back to my roots through my marriage with my husband. And I have been blessed to be able to actually go, you know, see my great grandfather's house. And I myself have been having the opportunities to plant food on the same lands. And it's, um, it's such a gift. And I too have been able to begin to get just a bit of a taste of what my ancestors were experiencing. 
And so this particular story of Bawayadona immediately came to my mind when Doug asked me to share a story. And to me, this is a testament to somebody who recognizes the work, the willpower that comes into working with the land, but then also the gratitude that is required for this reciprocal relationship. So there's a difference, right, between um, taking, only taking, which we do, but also giving back. And so Baba Yadola was somebody who, by way of working with, working on the land and farming and planting, he was actually able to gain plots of land. So they had basically systems where if you planted certain hectares of land, you could then eventually become an owner of that land. And so Baba Yadola, with his team of, of help, was working a wheat field. And it was the time to be able to actually prepare the wheat for use. And they spent days and days and days working with mules. And so the way that the, they would prepare the wheat is they would gather the wheat into bushels, which was one preparation, then put them in these kind of cylindrical pyramids to dry. And then eventually when it was ready, they would get their mules to kind of walk around, tread on these bushels of wheat in circles and circles and circles to be able to separate the seed from the straw. And so there would be, you know, work collecting the straw and then collecting the separated seed, which would later be prepared um, to turn, turn into flour. And one day after a very long day of work in, in the kind of September time, uh, Baba Yadola, after they had collected all of the seeds, separated the straw, uh, Baba Yadola left three piles of seed upon their kind of platform that was their little workstation area. It was the end of the evening, the sun was setting, and he left these three piles. And one of the other men who had come to work with him said, what are you doing, Bawayadola? This is, you know, perfectly good seed. Why are you leaving it behind? And he said that, that we have plenty for ourselves. And of course, there are other creatures that are living in this land. There are quails, there are ants, there are squirrels, there are tons of different creatures who, like us, need to feed themselves. And if we leave this behind, we show, you know, we show that we recognize their existence. And the next day they came back to work. And of course, all of the seed was gone. And to me, this was something that when I heard, I realized that my ancestors too knew how to live in reciprocity and knew that when they are guided by gratitude and guided by that honest recognition that we are not the only creatures in this world, that Mother Earth is listening, that God is listening, that the universe recognizes and honors that. And Baba Yadola was somebody who did not only hold this respect just for you know, other, forms of, you know, other forms of life, but also for other humans. He was somebody that through this, this practice of, of sheep herding and of raising cows and farming, he was able to accumulate enough wealth to build the first two-story home. And he actually had, the home still exists. It's kind of um, kind of in shambles, but there's a balcony that goes all the way around the house. And this was a really big move because it showed that, you know, we are still, we are living in homes, but we are still, you know, feeling the outdoors. And he on purpose built two stories because he recognized that his family only needed one of the stories. And the second story below, um, this was constantly filled with seasonal workers or people who had migrated for their studies and needed a place to stay or people who were kind of going through a tough time. And he never collected rent. And he is famous, too, for helping widowed women. So women who lost their husbands, he would give them plots of land, small plots of land, and would teach them ways of farming in order to be able to feed themselves. And to me, I wanted to share this story of my great grandfather because it shows that when we recognize and honor the gifts that this earth gives, we will be taken care of and it's re reciprocal. And thank you for, for listening and for receiving uh, for what me is, is a really generous gift of a story to know that uh, we can continue following in the lines of our ancestors and receiving the wisdom that they have for us to offer. So 
Oh, thank you. I wish Netta was here for to hear our thank yous, but thank you so much to Netta. Um, she's such a, a wonderful spirit in the universe and we are blessed to have, have an experience of her with us today. Um, our second speaker is um, from a project that is, I think, uh, truly um, um, embodying what uh, Netta was just talking about. So I could see Dion, I could see you um, agreeing. Um, Dion Washington is uh, here to, um, as a director of Project Roots, um, a program in um, South Phoenix and Mesa that um, is uh, growing food for, um, in food deserts and making um, it available for people who do not have access to healthy food themselves. And uh, she is an Arizona local, grew up in Glendale, went to Apollo High School and um, partnered with uh, Bridget Pettis from uh, many of you early Mercury fans. We were great Bridget Pettis fans in the beginning of the Mercury personally in our family. And uh, always, um, she was probably my favorite Mercury player ever. So my youngest is here to vouch for that. And um, so um, she and Bridget started uh, Project Roots and um, uh, Dion is a graduate, uh, undergraduate at, at, G at Grand Canyon University and now getting an MBA there. And um, on one half, or half acre of land in the spaces of opportunity, they have restored that land and with volunteers are growing um, amazing things. So I will um, stop talking and let Dion share her story with us. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Nona. Thank you so much. And Chrissy as well. Hopefully, um, can you all hear me okay? Just a thumbs up. You can hear me. Great. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for having me. Yes, my name is Dion Washington and I am with Project Roots. Uh, Bridget Pettis and I founded it about a year ago only. Um, so we're very new to the nonprofit world. We're very new to farming. Um, but our history and our ancestors are definitely not. And I think we just pull from them and learn and um, you know, try to plant things and kill things and try to plant them again and figure out how it works and just try to keep food alive to, to give to, to those who really need it, to those who have food insecurity. So um, I did not think that I would be doing this work. It just kind of fell into my lap, but I am so humbled and so honored to be able to feed people, um, especially because I, I myself and Bridget as well, I definitely came from food deserts and definitely had food insecurities in both households. So this is um, work that we take really, really personally, and we're so humbled to give back to a lot of the food banks that we ate from. Um, I was at St. Mary's Food Bank in Glendale the other day, and I was like, well, I remember coming with my mom to pick up our food box um, to feed my family. You know, that's how we, we ate. Um, and just be able to give back and give them a, a little over 3,000 boxes last year um, to distribute to whatever family needed it was so rewarding. And so just the work is great and I'm very blessed to be able to do it. So without further ado, I'm, I'm new to this. This is, please bear with me. I, um, I've never really told a story before. Normally it is Bridget who was the face of Project Roots. She, she's in the media all the time. So please bear with me, but I'm gonna do my best to tell my story about my grandparents and um, how I found out the similarities of what I'm doing now as a farmer and a gardener in a half acre of land, um, how it's very similar to the things that they did and that their parents did. So um, I'll go back to my grandfather. Uh, he's still living, he's 94 years old. His name is Ivory and he's from Lubbock, Texas. And I personally have never been to Lubbock, Texas but I hear it's really neat. And uh, there's a lot of farmland there. So my grandfather owned uh, this land. Of course, his parents owned the land and they finally had an opportunity to have some kind of business to grow different crops on the land. Um, my grandmother was a chef and they met um, somehow, I don't remember, but she was also a cook and just cleaned and uh, they met and about 30 days after they met, they got married and they were married for 52 years before she passed. Um, but I say all that to say they met knowing their roles, knowing what their strengths were. She was the provider, the warmth, the, the chef, and he was the hunter. My grandparents um, lived off the land, which is something that we're learning how to do right now. Um, we were blessed with um, a couple of acres of land in Maricopa, 
And Bridget is actually living on that land right now, trying to figure out how to live on the land and start a garden and um, have a big water tank that she has to pull water from and, and drink from and understand that maybe one day people might have to do that. And what, 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 do we, what do we have to do? How can we be prepared to at least know how to grow our own food? Um, and ironically, my grandparents did the same thing. You know, they, they didn't have a grocery store to go to. Most grocery stores that they were in wouldn't even let them in. Um, so they had to learn how to make their own food, grow their own food, cook it, um, hunt it, kill it, skin it, preserve it. Um, so those are all the things that my, my grandparents did. And here I am many years later, at least doing the vegetable side of it. I don't eat meat that much anymore. Um, but in speaking of vegetables, they were also gardeners. So when they moved from Texas, they moved to Flagstaff, Arizona, and they started all over again. And they lived in a two bedroom apartment until my grandfather found a home of my grandmother's dreams in Northern Flagstaff, and he still lives there. Um, and in the backyard of that home, he made her a full garden in her backyard. And it was like a five bedroom home upstairs, downstairs, just a home of her dreams that she just never thought she'd ever own. Um, he was a handyman, he knew how to build things. So he built an apartment complex and he built a really sturdy one and one that was affordable. And he started to let anybody who had some kind of funds live in it. And he turned that into a profitable business to be able to buy my grandmother that home. And my mother started to see um, our family just do a little bit better um, in a, a shorter amount of time. Um, I'm too young to remember those things, but I'm really happy to see that he worked really hard to give my grandmother at least the home of her dreams. Um, but in that backyard were things like squash and pumpkin and fig trees and moringa trees. And I didn't know it at the time, but my grandfather strategically planted things in his backyard that he knew one would last during certain seasons and two, that he could eat if he couldn't go to the grocery store. Nowadays, he could, he could have gone, but still, he just always thought with that mentality. Um, and that's kind of how we teach here at, at Project Roots. You know, we, we teach with, you know, we're very fortunate right now to be able to just get in our cars and go to the grocery store and pick up the things we need. But what if one day, especially given what's happened so recently, um, we, we couldn't do those things and it's not a scare tactic. Not at all. It's just, let's just be prepared for what if. Um, so I think that my grandparents set a good example for me. And I subconsciously remember these things as I'm here in Denver, Colorado with my sister. And I was talking to her about, I don't know what to say in this story. And what am I going to say? And she said, talk about our history. Talk about your grandparents. They were farmers. They were hunters. They lived on the land. They're doing all the things that you're doing right now, sister. And on top of that, from this land, we're taking it and we're giving it to food banks that me and my sister grew up eating from. And so I'm just really grateful. I, I sit here today in front of all of you, just really grateful and humble um, to be able to continue what my grandparents and their parents did. And I'm sure my ancestors did as well. Um, so my story is very short and brief, but I just, again, want to say thank you so very much for having me. And I'm looking forward to listening into the other storytellers and just let me know if you need anything. Thank you. Thank you, Dion. That was beautiful for sharing about your grandparents. And I know they're right behind you helping you do what you do. And I can't wait to come and visit also uh, what you're doing. So thank you so much for sharing. Our next storyteller up is um, Sunny Dooley. She uh, lives on the Navajo Nation near Gallup. She's a Navajo storyteller. And since 1982, she has been telling traditional Navajo Diné stories locally, nationally, and abroad. She didn't tell me to say the nationally and abroad, but I wanted to add that in because she has told at the Smithsonian and she has told overseas and all over the place. And I'm, uh, most honored to introduce Sunny Dooley and Ellie. I believe you're going to screen share a picture of um, the San Francisco Peaks for us. I am correct. And then uh, Sunny, I guess I uh, we will just unmute. Sunny's coming in on a telephone. There you are. And are you there? Yeah, it's a. 
Can you hear me, Chrissy? Yes. Awesome. Yet a Anos ko ada da isanos lagi sa sinita sa dunay da nose. Si ella tutok onsin na siya ng trabahan pa si Jean kaya ani da si Che do trachit ni da si Che. Sa nahapis ni ella da si nala do di si ko a asa ni Lenigi a pasyon sendo. Nijon ko si ella da isanos a do a do a eho a holo. Ako hot a e fancy case that the hanne kodo that it aki. It's a real pleasure and honor to share the afternoon with you and to hear the stories from the various individuals is fulfilling. And I think that that's what soil does. I know that as a child growing up, I ate dirt. <laughs> My mother had to wean me off of eating dirt by introducing me to mushrooms and olives because I would walk around with a pocket full of dirt and share it with people. And um, my great grandmother who was in my life for the first 12 years of my life um, never discouraged me. She just never said, you know, that's, that's dirty, that's awful, that's gross. None of those words ever came out of her mouth. Uh, she sort of indulged my taste for dirt. And we know that dirt, soil, earth, uh, whatever you want to call it, is the fundamental element needed to give us nourishment of all kinds nutritional nourishment for um, all of the living beings on earth require good dirt. And in our Diné culture, each mountain, the six of them that we have, its soil is sacred. And we have a bundle of mountain dirt that is really the foundation of what we called a blessed life. And so I was thinking about soil and stories. And yesterday I was on a seed panel and we talked about how do seeds and stories correlate. And they all go together because of soil. And this past year, from going March to March, the pandemic year that we have all experienced, one of the most beautiful gifts that brought so much joy uh, to the 47 families that I visited on a regular basis was a gigantic head of a sunflower. Two individuals from Albuquerque brought it and they presented it and I just looked at it and I just thought oh my goodness this is humongous and they had two of them and because we had to all be socially distanced from one another when we drove up to a home you know I had to yell through the mask um, to anybody who came out from the door you know which is greetings is there anything you need and I would hold up the sunflower and everybody was just mesmerized by it and they just got such joy from seeing this gigantic head of a sunflower and um, when I came home I you know, let the sun, you know, you harvest the sunflowers and you let them out. I roasted them. I didn't salt them, but I just divided all the sunflower seeds into little bags and handed them out to, to the families. There was roasted and unroasted. And one of the ladies says, give me the unroasted one. And I said, okay. And I thought she would take the salted um, I mean, not the salted, but the roasted one. 
And then I said, why do you want the unroasted ones? And then she kind of looked at me and she says, I'm going to grow it. I'm going to grow it because I remember the day you came with that big giant sunflower head and you gave me such joy. She said, I didn't even think about it, but it just made me so happy. And it brought tears to my eyes because I thought that I wasn't intending for that to happen. You know, I just was trying to be a little silly and, you know, just trying to create um, some some sense of, you know, friendship and camaraderie because the pandemic just changed how we interact with one another. And everything was just so distant. You know, we just couldn't be like how we could be with one another. And the other day when I was on the seed panel, I relayed the same story. And I said, it's just marvelous and wonderful that something growing, something that grew, something that was planted, something that was put into rich, dark, deep soil to bring such joy. And to me, that's what soil does. When you smell wet earth, it just gives you a sensation that is most satisfying. And when you come to a farmer's market and you see all that is displayed and you think, wow. And at the tail end of that last letter, W, you know, W-O-W, -W, right? Wow. That little sigh as you exhale that word, I think is, is as lovely as the first story we heard from the young lady who talked about her great grandfather on her father's side, the generosity. And soil is generosity. Earth is generous. And as we celebrate just a week of earth, let's make it our intention to celebrate earth all the days of our lives that we wake up, that we get to go to sleep, that we get nourished, that we think of the birds, animals, reptiles, and insects, and all the species in between Earth Mother and Sky Father. And the next time you see some dirt, wet your pointer finger and taste it. It's quite delicious. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Sunny. We got a lot of claps and a lot of heart emojis and clap emoji. Mm. Thank you for sharing that beautiful, <laughs> beautiful account. <laughs> oh boy, I could see everything. It must have been so cute to watch you eat dirt when you were a little girl, anyway. <laughs> We were so very it's very good. It's very good. I'm sure it is. And you must have needed some minerals in it. <laughs> well, you know, we also have this clay in our here up in, in our area um, that we actually eat as um, mm. I don't know if it's medicinal. I don't think so, but it's it's like a very rich clay that we can eat. So sometimes, you know, maybe somebody will give you a piece of clay and you can eat it. Yeah. <laughs> the, the clays yeah. are medicinal. They are sunny. There are people who eat different okay. clays to to heal their bodies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. Well, thank you again. That was beautiful. You're and, welcome. Uh, thank you, Christy. Thank you. Uh, next up, uh, we have Gloria Montano Green. I'm going to read her bio. She's born here in Arlington, Arizona, between Buckeye and Gila Bend. Uh, she's a proud graduate of University of Arizona, 
former state executive director for the Farm Service Agency in Arizona from 2014 to 17. She served as chief, chief of staff to Congressman Raul Grijalva. She also served as deputy director for Chispa Arizona, a program of the League of Conservation Voters focused on empowering Latino voices in Arizona on issues including energy, public lands, and democracy access. It's a fantastic organization. She was appointed by the Biden administration to be deputy under secretary for the USDA's farm production and conservation mission area on February 22, 2021. Well, congratulations, Gloria, and welcome. And we can't wait to hear your story. Uh, thank you all. This is very intimidating because uh, storytelling is not my business. I like to listen to stories and I like to listen to history. Um, when Doug asked me about this, the first vision that popped in my head was my grandmother and I taking walks a few days after it rained. So to lay it down, I was raised in Arlington, Arizona, uh, probably three miles from a paved road. So everything was dirt road. And um, when it rained and it would have a good monsoon, half of the roads would become um, unable to be used because they would be filled with lakes. We called them the Montaño Lake growing up, but it was really just puddling. And my grandmother, for some reason, would always come and visit a couple weeks after that great rain and the puddle had disappeared and the dirt would crackle. And she loved to go out and walk in her, I can see her now in her SAS shoes with her white bobby socks pulled over and she would do tiny, tiny steps to make the crackling of the dirt go more and more. And that was the first vision that chopped in my head because she loved to hear the dirt crackle under her feet that in this pond that used to be there, you know, a week before. Um, so that was like the first vision that popped in my head. But the rest of it is really thinking about my dad and uh, what my dad gave up to immigrate to the United States and what he pursued and how he taught values that really is something that resonates to me now that I get to work with the U.S. Department of Agriculture. So my dad has always been connected to the land. He was raised in a small rural town, had head of cattle with his family and his siblings, grew various fruits and vegetables, but um, started immigrating into the United States about an hour away from the border when he was 12. And so he had various tasks of life. When I told him first I was gonna work for the Department of Agriculture, he explained to me why he was never a migrant worker because he had his hands were too small to pick cotton. And the two times he picked cotton, his, he bloodied the cotton and they wouldn't let him pick anymore. So he could pass because my dad's very blonde haired, blue eyed Mexican. And he learned how to do the operations and the mechanics. And so that's how he decided to learn his career. So when I was born, my parents had, were working, my dad was working at a cattle company in Arlington, Arizona. He was doing the maintenance work. I'm very proud. If you ever go and see cattle company now, there's one structure standing. And it's the one that my dad with the third grade education created without an engineering degree. And it's the only thing still standing out there. And so he purchased five acres of his own land and it was nothing. It was just empty, no grass, no vegetation, no movement. But for me growing up, it was like the most gorgeous oasis because what I remember is anytime he was home and he wasn't doing the double shift, he was out there with a shovel moving the dirt. He would wake up my siblings and move the dirt, but boys, he would let me every now and then pull the weeds. <laughs> I was not allowed to touch anything that grew. <laughs> uh, and I think he just constantly, you know, showed us and he always told us in his way, hay que cuidar, poner atención, hay que respetar, we take care of things, pay attention to what you're doing, respect what you're doing. And he created this gorgeous oasis. And I just think of him and soil and, you know, with his shovel, shaping where the water would grow. So he could use the washing machine water to water all of our trees 
in one direction. And there was like a beautifully laid a row for irrigation that he would do to recycle and repurpose water. I could think of him in a tractor. You know, we always laughed at him because he never had a tractor that quite worked. One would go forward and then he'd find to use one and it could go reverse really well. But for some reason, the tractor was never quite complete. But he would be there and, you know, he, when you live in rural parts where there's no pavement, knowing somebody who can level the land and level the dirt to be able to make sure things are accessible, especially after rain, is really important. And my dad, to this day, is still the person that someone down the street calls and say, hey, Lupe, can you help move some dirt for me? Can you help? Can you bring your tractor and help me out? So I think of those, and I guess for me, soil is living. Like the richest soil and the most rewarding feeling soil is when a, you pick it in your hand and a worm moves between your fingers. And it reminds us that soil is living. It's the most precious commodity that so we take for granted. We, you know, there's that song, it's like, we pave paradise to put up a parking lot. You know, you could probably hear the song, I'm not a good singer, but like, it's just always stunning to me, you know, how much we forget about that. And I'm from rural parts. I went away to college. When I went away to college, I had opportunities and I moved away to DC. And I just never quite understood why things didn't connect. And it's just like, because when it rains in D Washington, DC, a major city, the earth doesn't release its reward of scent. So you don't get to hear the desert smell and the desert rains. The plants, I don't know if it's because they take it for granted that they have so much water and the rest of us don't have it here doesn't smell as beautiful as it does in Arizona. Um, so, you know, I've come to appreciate it when I would come home and now even more so, the more I could be barefoot to put my feet in the ground and the dirt, the better it is. The more there's dirt stuck in between my toenails that there's no way of getting it out, the better life is and the more rewarding it is. So for soil, it is, it is living, it is part of, our future and it's something we can't take for granted but it's also something that completely embodies all of our senses in ways that we forget about it we feel it in our hands when our bare feet we feel it in our shoulders when we move it in the shoulder especially when it tells us don't move me and go move another part we smell it i love it after rain today in phoenix it's not raining but i swear it's about to rain because the dirt smells a little bit different uh, I love it right after you put water on it to flower, you know, water your plants uh, right before sundown. It just smells a little bit different than when you water it in the morning. It looks different depending if it's dry, depending if it's, you know, been soaked, how much sand is in it. Uh, in certain parts, how red it is and the color of it. It's just, it's just stunning to see and how it can mold thinking about the child making the mud pie and the figure that goes four to five, six inches high. And the taste. Well, I didn't really eat dirt. I always love it whenever something fell, like a fig, a mulberry, a carrot that you pulled and just ate it fresh, or the tomato you pick from the vine without cleaning it. You just rub it with your dirty finger and you stick it in your mouth and you just remember there's something more authentic about it. And definitely the sounds of it the sounds of the dirt. And for me, it's going back to my grandmother. And I just always think of her and those little hard pieces of soil that are just the crunch and the satisfaction that a rain had just occurred. And there's just like something to take it a little bit slow and to walk a little bit. So thank you for inviting me to think about it. Right now I get to work at USDA and one of the departments I oversee is about soil health. And uh, it's kind of ironic because I, I don't think I thought about it in my whole journey, but this conversation really made me connected. So thank you. Thank you so much, Gloria. And uh, I'm so excited you're in the position that you're in to um, be able to bring about um, some really creative and important programming that uh, that is in store for us. I I'm very excited about that. And um, I am so moved by the connection to the land that all of these stories have shown so far. And before I inter introduce our last speaker, 
um, I realized we did not um, do our land acknowledgement in our uh, you know, excitement and um, sort of anxiety about starting a program. And um, I just want to acknowledge the, the people who have the deep, deep knowing of the land um, where I am particularly in, in Phoenix is North Phoenix, just north of Piestua Peak. And um, this land is um, um, the land of the upper Pima, the Akamal Aotam and uh, the Hohokam. And uh, certainly uh, we are not taking nearly as good care of it as they did, but uh, we will probably be in a position of needing to learn from them again, I have a feeling. So um, our very last speaker, um, I'm very excited about uh, um, hearing uh, um, what, what she has to say. Her name is Kate Tyrion. Uh, she is from Deep Dirt Institute in Patagonia, Arizona, and uh, Kate grew up as a curious child um, on a pre-industrial 11th century farm in West Wales. So we have the, the planet covered in some interesting directions here today with her father who taught agricultural practicum and her mother who was a self-taught naturalist who shared that delight and skill set with her five daughters. She is a graduate of the Eco Horticulture Program at UC Santa Cruz and is a certified expressive arts therapist, a permaculture teacher and designer with a focus on organic food systems as foundational to human and planetary health. Since 2005, she um, envisioned and built a demonstration site at the Deep Dirt Institute campus on in Patagonia, Arizona, using native materials, waste, and the enthusiastic energy of youth to pro and we all need that enthusiastic energy of youth, I'll tell you, um, to accomplish her vision of inspiring humans to adopt a new way of thinking about life on a precious and finite planet. So um, Kate, I'm very excited to um, give you the stage for, for your story. Thank you. Well, first, thank you for the invitation and opportunity to tell a story. Um, and to acknowledge that the land of deep dirt is part of the traditional lands of the Tono Otam and the Apache people um, that we are currently using as our teaching center. It's lovely to hear these stories. And um, as the fourth child of four girls growing up on a farm, um, which was also the flour mill for our community from the 16th century until the year my parents bought it in 1946. Um, it was, uh, there was only no road in until I was 12 when my father put enough shale on the cart track to make a surface hard enough to drive a car on. I was the one homesick when the ele electric was turned on and I was about seven and I got to switch the light on for the first time in our house and I was amazed at how bright it was in there. Um, and when I was 16 and a half, we moved to a bigger farm and we had a flush toilet and a television that year. So it was a big event. Our elementary school that we walked some distance to, and I've been trying to think about how far that must have been, but at least a mile and a half, I suspect maybe even two, had two small gardens in it, which provided all the vegetables for our main meal, which was served in the middle of the day. And the um, animal products that were in there were produced in the community. In the summer on the way to school, in, when we were lucky, we would look for tiny wild strawberries and we would harvest them and thread them onto a blade of grass because they were no bigger than your little finger. But if you have ever tasted one of those wild strawberries, you could hardly ever eat another strawberry again. It is the ultimate flavor of anything. There was a river that ran through our farm and um, that was part of our playground. And my mother, bless her often, I think of her so much now and all that she gifted us with. She was uh, so curious about where we lived and she had reference books for flowers, for trees, for mushrooms, for birds, for whatever it was. And we asked a question and it was, get out the rest <laughs> reference book and let's go outside. And so we did that together. And so I'm deeply grateful. My father's big interest was pedigree dairy cattle, improving the breed. So we had 
very thoughtfully bred livestock. And um, recently I was writing a story that because we made our own butter, you didn't go to the store where we were and how we lived. Um, it was a lot of work to clean up five kids, to get them to walk through the fields and up and over a stile on a hedge through the neighbor's field, down their lane to the road where you walked a bit more to catch a bus to go to town. And it always involved the dentist. So we were never particularly excited to go. So given that my, um, we made butter at home. And so if my mother ever asked me to go and fetch cream to make the butter, it was only sometimes, and we would go with a saucer and these 10 gallons of milk had been sitting overnight. The cream had floated to the top. And you took a saucer and out of each 10 gallons, you could take only two saucers worth of cream because it mattered when you're breeding pedigree dairy cattle, how much fat you have relative to the rest of the milk and it's checked every time it goes off to market. So you'd carefully dip that saucer into the cream and put it into your jug and again, and repeat and repeat until you'd been through all the milk churns. And then whoever got to collect the cream got to lick the saucer afterwards. And that was worth doing. Making butter was not much fun because it was a hand cranking jar, but having a ball of butter to eat at the end was pretty sweet. We had an orchard and we kept bees and we grew crops for the livestock. It was old style farming where the soil mattered. It was the root of our livelihood. You had to give back. So the manure that the animals generated if they were closed in in the winter to keep them drier and warmer in this wet place with dark soil um, was taken out and spread on the fields in the spring and the animals released into the fields for grass, which they were fenced to go through. The strip of electric fence moved the cows through the field, so many feet of fresh grass every day and followed by chickens and sometimes the pigs would go afterwards. And one time I thought I could take a young calf out to the field on a halter, it was small. And I thought I was strong enough not true. <laughs> that calf decided it was spring and she kicked up her heels and dragged me around on my belly through that green grass, but I was not willing to let go. My mother wrote stories during this time that were published in the Farmer's Weekly and she wrote a story once called How Not to Garden. And the story was about my first garden as about a nine-year-old and my enthusiasm for fencing out predators overwhelmed the electric fencing and ruined my efforts. But there you could open the furrow in the soil and put your seeds in and cover them up carefully and come back sometime later. And if the slugs and snails and rabbits hadn't eaten them and you had a reward, there was no irrigation required. Then I went to the London School of Fashion and from there moved to Las Vegas, Nevada and the Mojave Desert. And in that period of my life and in finding myself a long way from home and homesick and in an abusive marriage, I turned to soil as my way of finding salvation and hope far away. And I, I tended that soil and I planted those plants, but the violence disrupted my tending. And so the plants died. And that was pretty much a reflection of that moment in my life but I came back to the land again when I moved away and I escaped with my daughter and we farmed together. She as a two-year-old and another three and a four-year-old together, we worked the land and they little naked children and myself out in the garden would open the soil and feed it and tuck in the seeds and water it and tend that harvest and we ate from that. And then I moved into, um, a life in real estate in Southern California and away from land, away from soil, away from that kind of nurturing and I became ill. And that becoming ill was a gift to me. It frightened me. I thought, what if I die? 
what if I am gone, who takes care of my child? And so I uh, went on a search and I found a story and I found a story about our industrial food system. And that food system story had a contrast to the story I knew from my childhood. And it was an awakening into the idea of the effect of the industrial food system on my body. And the more I learned about that, the more I came to understand the effect of that, not just on my body, but on the bodies of those that worked in that system and on the body of the planet herself. And that began a journey for me that, that led me to this place of deep dirt farm and institute, which is now merged. The institute is now merged with our partners, Borderlands Restoration Network. We have our campus and there we, we have developed a place for youth to learn. We've had about 4,000 young people. We have a, a human food component of this that is worked by women Grow Food is the name of it. It's an active name because we actively work it every Friday. They come, we farm together. It's a way of resistering myself and connecting people to the essence of life, which is the soil. And it is a place where we um, manage erosion and infiltrate water and use the soil to build walls out of adobe bricks. It's where we talk about what the future can be instead of where we're coming from, this is where we are coming to. Of lately, I have been learning more about the microbiome and how that is so connected to the soil and the reflection of compost external to me and compost internal to me, that the microbes in my body are the same as the microbes in the compost that I nourish the soil with. The microbes in my body nourish me. They break down what I eat and turn it into food to keep me strong and healthy. The same way that the microbes in the soil do this for the plants that they grow, that we eat. And those connections have become so vital in my thinking about what we need to do to care for our beautiful planet. And I'd like to read just the last little bit of what I was writing today in response to this, um, this moment. And um, I'm so grateful for this and for an opportunity to have my hands in the soil all the time. So when life challenges me, it is the soil that beckons, that asks my participation to restore its life as it restores mine. Now in this chapter of my life, I begin again at my home in a small patch of crystalline soil, ancient and once fiery, volcanic and spewing two feet below its original surface. I'm in now in subsoil. It is unyielding ground, but it's willing. Is this where I am, I wonder? Am I unyielding with age and fixed patterns or can I yield and soften? And I put this question into the soil, working with water, my ally. I open the hard ground and pry out the rocks. And as I do in the kitchen, I make a recipe, a nutritious bounty, a measure of life growing compost, a cup of part burned twigs, a home for fungi, acidic fiber to balance the burnt wood. I mix it well. On my knees, a prayerful pose. The soil receives all that I hold in this time. My angst, fear for our grandchildren's future, anxious for change. And I pour love and promise to never give up for bringing beauty into this world to inspire as I tuck the tender roots of life that will feed me and those I love into the waiting soil. Thank you so much for being with me and listening. Thank you so much, Kate. That was so beautiful. All of the stories are so moving. Um, 
I, uh, we are opening um, up the conversation for, um, for questions. And uh, I think the um, best way to do that perhaps is um, for people to put their hand up um, with the reaction button if you have a question to ask or write it in the chat. Um, we have, um, depending how long people want to stay, we have five minutes officially, but we have definitely more time unofficially. Um, so if, um, as long as our presenters are, are able to stay, um, we can stay and answer questions. So please uh, feel free to ask. So um, this is Ellie. Yeah. Can I share my screen and show folks who may not know how to um, raise their hand to do that now? Absolutely. Wonderful. Ah. Where'd you go? <laughs> There's Dave Chappelle. That's great. Oh, oh no. Well, hey, yeah, it is Dave Chappelle because he's yeah. fantastic. Okay. He's fun. Where did the meeting go? So I don't know where the meeting went. I apologize. I was going to share my screen so you could see that at the bottom of your Zoom screen, just in case um, they do updates, they change things, whatever. But you will see where your re um, where your reactions is, where you've been hitting your heart and you're clapping and thumbs up in some cases. And right below it, you should have an icon that says raise hand. So if you do that, Nona will go ahead and call on you and please feel free to unmute yourself. And sorry for my technology thing. You're doing such a great job with technology. So you don't have to, you don't have to apologize. I'm, so, um, if you uh, want to just raise your hand like this, you certainly can, um, or, um, all right, um, I see Laurel's hand, so I'm going to call on Laurel first. Go ahead, Laurel. My questions are primarily for Gloria Montano Green. What was uh, your education that, uh, what was your education and what first took you to D.C.? Thank you, Laurel. Um, so uh, I'm a first generation high school graduate, as well as a first generation college graduate. Um, and my mind thinks in numbers. So I was going to do something with numbers as my college degree, and I ended up um, failing academically for the first time in my life. And I decided to take general education requirements while I was trying to figure out what is this college thing and I can't tell my parents I failed. Um, and in that, I ended up taking my first ever Mexican-American studies degree, my Mexican-American studies class. And what I learned was that the part of Arizona that I was raised in, I'm Mexican-American, uh, was previously part of Mexico. And for me, it was an eye-opening in that I belong, right? Because I was always in this whole space of, do I belong or do I not? Daughter of immigrants and be quiet, you know, you know, uh, take care. So that was very eye-opening for me. So I actually ended up getting my degree in Mexican-American studies with a focus of history uh, and culture. Uh, and what um, my purpose was, was to find out how do we share the Arizona Chicano history um, to be able to learn from it, right? Like we can't move forward if we don't learn from our past. And so I actually ended up interviews, uh, interviewing a guy named Supervisor, Pima County Supervisor of Raul Grijalva, <laughs> but mm. way before he ran for Congress. And, yeah. um, and then he ended up running for Congress. Um, mm -hmm. And so it just kind of happened there. And he approached me to work for him. And I was like, well, I don't really believe in government. <laughs> I want to work in community work and I want to do this history. And he goes to me, well, you care about community? And I said, yes. And he's like, well, the biggest place to make change for communities inside government. And that's the best way to make it open and accessible. So I really didn't have a good argument for him. So that kind of started my whole path on, on government work. Um, and, and it's, and so I've done a little bit of every policy area that you can possibly think of, maybe except for foreign policies and one I haven't touched yet. Okay. And following that is what exactly is your title? I didn't get it. Yeah. 
So I'm the Deputy Undersecretary for Farm Production and Conservation. For so under farm the U production? Yes, and Farm Production and Conservation. Uh -huh. So U.S. Department of Agriculture, I think, is one of the most amazing of the departments of the federal government. You know, people think about education, health and human services, et cetera. Um, but Department of Agriculture touches everything in everybody's personal lives. Like we are feeding children with school lunches, right? Uh, we're helping farmers to make sure they don't fall out of um, the industry. Being a, like being a farmer is a high risk industry. It is like you know you work a lot, and one crop can nine months worth of work or a year and a half worth of work can go away. Um, and they do a lot of uh, rural um, broadband investment. And sometimes it doesn't have to be rural, it needs to be like high need. So within the Department of Agriculture, there's um, different areas. And so the one that I, as a deputy undersecretary is the Farm Production and Conservation. And in that has the Farm Service Agency, um, Risk Management Agency, and the Natural Resources and Conservation Services. And so they're mostly known really well by producers, by people that are farmers and ranchers, um, but they do are the ones that are support, like natural resource and conservation does a lot of soil health planning and collaboration. Ah. So you will have some impact over whether no-till farming and regenerative farming is uh, highlighted? Uh -huh. So the conversation, I think you maybe since the Biden and Harris administration has started, um, there's been a lot of conversation about what is climate smart agriculture and forestry looks like. Um, well, we aren't the only area that'll be responsible in drafting and creating some of those incentives. Um, a lot of um, the work has been done in some ways in the past, just hasn't been a lot more intentional and supportive, but the climate smart agriculture is what you'll be hearing is here. The other part is we're implementing a lot of the American Rescue Plan, which was passed by the Congress and signed by the president um, about a month and a week ago, maybe just barely a month ago. And in there is um, some direct charge on providing equity within the Department of Agriculture and debt relief for um, farmers that identify as either one or more of African American or Black, Hispanic, Latino, Asian American, um, Pacific Islander, American Indian, Alaska Native, uh, to be able to provide debt relief for those that have um, pending loans. And, and then also think about how we're removing some of the barriers to accessibility within the Department of Agriculture. Thank you. It's a big job, I have to say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so much to do and so, so great to know you're in that position. Um, so um, any other um, questions anybody wants to ask? Um, I would say, I personally wanna ask um, Kate about, um, I was so excited when we talked about this program about the possibility of um, somehow going to see what they're doing there because it sounds so um, dramatic. And I also would like to ask that question of Dion for Project Roots. How do people in the public get involved in um, the programs that you're working on. Um, I'll direct that first to Kate since I sort of started there, but if both of you would um, talk about what, um, what is helpful to you um, uh, and how the public, what, what's helpful to, for me, for my own personal needs, I wanna know how to go there and see it and touch it and you know share the magic. But um, if you would share that, that'd be great and any, I think there have been some websites um, in the uh, that Ellie has posted for both of your organizations, but uh, just in general for um, action, how, how do we, what could we do to be part of what you're doing? Deep Dirt is currently in transition. I'm 73 and I need to uh, back off a little bit. Um, and COVID has been tough for us because we've had to shut programming down for over a year now. Um, so I have actually asked a group of young people to um, imagine that they own it. And I want that, ask them to create a vision for how they see it going forward. And so they've been working on that since December with some wonderful facilitators 
who are taking a sabbatical here from two universities in Boston. And so we're having uh, one of the facilitators teaches a master's in public health and her husband teaches service learning at a, an economics university. So they bring to bear a lot of experience and skill. And um, also they brought over a number of years, they brought people to Deep Dirt as part of their programming. So they come with a familiarity. And as the founder, you know, founders can get in the way. So I have said, I will step out while you do this dreaming. <laughs> And so we're um, working on this transition and they have come up with a whole wonderful framing of how we are going to go forward and are working toward that. And I have a young woman who's part of this, who is um, taking our emails for us. And I'm gonna put that in the chat box so you can um, reach out to one of two people, uh, Sheridan um, Egan or Denise Yorena Ortega are the two people. And, um, and we'll set it up and they'll, they'll coordinate for me so that we can plan on when you have a group together, we can set up a date that works for me as well. And then we can create a tour for you. How's that? We just had one yesterday. It took three and a half hours, just so you know. <laughs> we scheduled three hours for sure. It's a lot of walking around. And so, you know, being comfortable in somewhat rugged terrain walking around, my mother taught me how to walk, either stop or high speed. So the, those are the two modes of feet in my family. And I tend to go on high speed and then we stop. So sort of being prepared that way is useful as well. And if weather is an issue, choosing a time of year where it's either not too warm or maybe in the rainy season, which can be pretty amazing if we have one this year. We didn't get one last year, it was so sad. So I put in the chat now, both Sheridan and, um, and Denise's phone, uh, email addresses for you, for Deep Dirt. Thank you. And Dion, if you wanna say something about um, Project Roots and, and, and Sunny, if, I don't know if Sunny, yeah, Sunny's still on. If there is any, um, anything also that uh, the larger community can do to be supportive of the families um, on the Navajo Nation through any um, structure that you would like to share with us, please, please do so. Thank you. But I'll, Dion, if you go first and then Sunny at the end. Thank you. Sure. Well, thank you so much again for having us. Um, so a little bit about Project Roots. We are a 501c3 nonprofit community garden. We started in the heart of South Phoenix, where we have a half acre of land, where you can volunteer there. We can um, set you up with a local community garden manager. Her name is Sierra, and she'll give you a tour of the land. She'll tell you the needs of that we need for the day. And you can sign up at projectrootsaz.org forward slash volunteer. Um, however, if you're not able to volunteer or if it's starting to get a little bit warmer, of course, any kind of donations are also very helpful for us. We just acquired some more land at Agave Farms and it is in tough, tough shape. We are in need of somebody who has access to a tiller. So I don't necessarily mean funds. I mean access to tools or a company that could help us till our land. We have to do it one more time before we become a no-till land. Um, just to be able to get all of the old um, soil out. So that's something we really, really need right now. Um, we did receive a car recently, but it's at the mechanic and um, it's not safe to drive yet, but we would use that car to deliver all of our produce boxes to the food banks that um, ask every week of us. Um, and those are just some of the things. I mean, there's a list that I could really go on and on about, but if you just wanna be active physically, sign up online to volunteer. If you wanna donate, you also can donate online as well at projectrootsaz.org forward slash donate, or you can email me personally. I'll put my email in the chat if you have access to some type of tools that could get our agave garden going. That garden is going to be the garden that we send all the food out to the food banks next season. And I wanna say one more thing to Kate. Kate, you can grow in your garden year round. Don't wait for the, the rain and call me when you're ready and I'll, I'll let you know what you can plant and what's good in the heat. Cause we have a lot that thrive in the, in the heat. So I promise you can plant year round. <laughs> 
Um, but that's it. Oh, and one more thing, we have a garden box program. If you ever want a garden box in your backyard, we don't make any money from that. We just hire young entrepreneurs who know how to build boxes or have access to fresh soil or want to run a business, an irrigation business. We employ them with your funds, with your donations. So again, thank you for having me. Always a pleasure. I am done. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, um, any other questions? We're just about getting close to 530. And I noticed about half of our participants are gone. So uh, it's probably getting to be dinner time. But um, any other any other thoughts before we close the program? Chrissy, do you want to say anything else? Uh, um, no, I just want to thank everyone who came this uh, afternoon and all the storytellers. And just so what I love about story is it brings memories of my own uh, upbringing. And I'm sure everybody memories of their experiences with soil. And uh, thank you for sharing these beautiful stories. And I just uh, wish you all a very lovely evening. Thank you all. Thank you. Happy Earth Week. Happy Earth Day. Happy Earth every day. Right. <laughs> thank you.